Hi, this is Frankie Pace. Join me every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for great interviews with comedians, actors, singers, playwrights, producers, directors, musicians, composers, along with some of my best comedy sketches like Ask the Godfather, The Adventures of Herb and Eddie, Huck and Finn, Pothead Lenny, Habib, and Talking with Grandpa. All on www.thefrankiepayshow.com. Hi, this is Frankie Pace, and welcome to the Frankie Pace Show. My guest tonight is a warm-up comic for the David Letterman Show. He's also a talent coordinator for that show. Uh, he's an old friend. I've worked with him many times. He's done hundreds of television shows, worked in Australia, worked in England, worked in Iran, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Japan. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But he's worked everywhere. He's done a lot of work. He's a very talented guy. The one and only Eddie Brill is with us tonight on the Frankie Pay Show. Eddie Brill, Eddie Brill, how are you? I am well, Frankie. I'm <laughs> work, I'm relaxing before I go play poker with my poker buddies. Yeah, are they comedians, or are they uh, entertainers, or are they just guys, like, you know, regular guys for a change? Yeah, it's a combination of all that, guys and girls, uh, poker uh, players. We've been doing this game for, like, 19 years, mm -hmm. and it just started with all the comics that sort of lived in my area, and uh, and it, it got a lot of them moved to L.A., and new people moved in, and it's gone, you know, the, the consistent people have been here most of the time, well, mostly William Stevenson, the comedian. Oh, yeah, William. Geez, that's a name from the past. Yeah, so, you know, but it's, it's just, there's a lot of really good places, and people come from all over the world, and when they come to New York, they call to see if there's room to come to the games. All in. You ever get that? Yes. <laughs> no, yeah. no, we don't play. Actually, we don't play. Texas Hold'em. barely Holden. play Hold'em, so. Yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, we started before the Hold'em craze. That's a nerve, that's nerve-wracking, man. If I had, like, uh, like, you know, forty thousand dollars, and uh, and I got a fantastic hand, and the other guy goes all in. It's like, oh man, what do I? Do? I know, I know. I don't need that. <laughs> you know what? That, the, the whole thing is not about. It's really not about. You know, it's like we play every week, so we don't want to kill anybody. We just want to have fun. We laugh. Yeah. William brings a great set list of great music, and we laugh, and we tell. You know, that's great, man. A lot of fun, a lot of stories, and happens to have poker in, in between. You know? We do that over here in my, in my condo. All the old guys come out, they pull their teeth out, and they drink whiskey. Yeah, and they, so. they play bocce with their teeth. <laughs> yeah, and it's all, you know, uh, 10 and 20, you know, big bucks, 10, 10 cents and 20 yeah, cents. We don't go that high. I won $9 one night. I was so excited. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually a bonus. <laughs> here, you know, you, 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 you don't win much, you don't lose <clears throat> Occasional night where you lose a bunch, you'll win it back the next. Yeah, year, you know. So you were you were born in New York, raised in uh, Florida. Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn, Bensonhurst. I mm -hmm. lived there till I was twelve. Then I, my family, my mom and dad got divorced. My mom met a new guy. Um, it was sort of a <coughs> mixture of two different cultures. They were having all the people were fighting over culture. So we just packed up and got out of there and and uh, and had a lot of fun down in Florida, away from all. The, Mess. And uh, you started out, actually, you started out as a copywriter for an ad company or something like that? So yeah, you know, when I was in college, I did comedy. I, I started doing comedy right away. and uh, I didn't plan on it. I never thought I'd do it. I loved comedy. I loved Carlin. He was mm -hmm. a pro. And, but I never thought I'd do it. And then in college, I the first friends I met were all really funny people. And part of that group was Dennis Leary and Mario Cantone. And there's a bunch of name, name, names. And names that are not famous that are fantastic performers and comedians. Oh, you, you had a workshop, they, though, right? It was so we did a workshop. Emerson, a comedy workshop. Uh, Emerson College or something like that? Was it Emerson? Exactly. Emerson in Boston. Yeah. My kid went to Emerson. Wright was going to school with us, and he was doing stand-up. So we went to go see him, and we met all the great Boston comics like Lenny Clark and Steve right. Queenie and Don Gavin and Kenny Rogerson, all the great greats. 
And then we started doing stand-up, and that was pretty good. So then I graduated college, and I thought, hey, that was fun. I had a blast doing that. I didn't make any money, but I had a good time. Mm. Now I need a real job, so I moved back to New York, (laughs) you know, hang out with my friends and family in New York. And I got a job as a copywriter, and I lied for a living. You know, I, I every every day I told lies about these products, and right, right, and it was not that much fun. And I started missing doing stand up because all my friends from college can continued to do stand up. All my contemporaries back then, you know, there was uh, guys like Tony V and uh, you know, brilliant uh, Bobcat Goldthwait and yeah. all those guys, and they continued to yeah. do stand up. Paula Poundstone, you know, it was just great comics, and then. I just missed it. So I, I had an opportunity in 1984 to get back in. Uh, a guy I went to college with worked at a restaurant in the NYU neighborhood and said they want to start a comedy thing. And he asked me if I would do it. And I started a comedy club in July of 84 called The Paper Moon and uh, started uh, booking comics and started performing again. And I haven't stopped since then. In fact, you booked me there. Yes. The Paper Moon and... Uh and uh, it was a nice little room. It was right next to a fire, uh, the fire department, right off. Tom of, Molino, uh, the firehouse, and then the paper moon. Yeah, and it was right off, uh, right off of McDougal. Around a corner was the it was comedy on third cellar. between uh, Thompson and Sullivan, about two and a half blocks from yeah. the cellar. A quaint little room, a, a good room to work out. Actually, uh, uh, people right on top of you. You know, that's what you want. Yeah, you know, we set it up. Where you know, Colin Quinn helped me set hmm. it up, and. I had just met Colin, and we, you know, we wanted to make it a room for comedians. <coughs> but we built a room downstairs so the comedians had a place to hang out, and we made we set it up so that the lights, the sound, everything was really conducive to a great comedy show. We put the crowd right up close. You know, we we didn't charge a lot of money. We sold out all our shows, and uh, it became a popular place. And comedians got to really, you know, when you're running around the city, you're doing 15 minutes here, 12 minutes there. But we let comics stretch out and do longer sets. It was pretty good. Yeah, I had fun working there. I had, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the comedy cellar was pretty good. But it was basically, uh, it wasn't so much of a gymnasium. They wanted you to produce and you had to do your top stuff. And uh, But your your room there, you were, you were able to expand a little bit. And that's what comics need because it, they need a little gymnasium kind of uh, atmosphere. To Great way to put it. Yeah, you know, and I wanted that... Uh, I wanted comics not to feel like there was any pressure on them. It's like, you know, even if someone didn't do well, I didn't count them out. I just said, you know, look, you know, you have, there are nights you don't do well, and then there are nights that, you know, then, you know, if you just keep going at it after a few months, you start getting better. You know, you see some comics like six months later, and it's like, oh, my God, they've leaps and bounds. So you, have to, you have to have a place where you're comfortable enough to play and mm-hmm. that there's no pressure on you, and, and the audience knew that, and they came knowing that. And they got to see a lot of phenomenal comedians before they were famous, including, you know, Adam Sandler was going to school at NYU down the street. And, you know, we were, you know, we were lucky to have him come in and, and, you know, guys like Jake Johansson and John Mendoza and Dennis Miller, and they all loved the room to come in to work out. So it worked out really well. And uh, people really had a good time. And and, and like Brett Butler and all these people, John Stewart, all these people weren't famous. And all these years later, I run into people going, you know, I saw John Stewart at the Paper Moon for the first time. It's like, yeah, because he felt comfortable enough. He didn't have to go impress some booker. Yeah. It was just a bunch of comics. John Stewart was a pretty cool guy, though, in the beginning. He was real, he's a real sweet guy. I mean, uh, yeah, he always was. He comes on like, you know, this, <laughs> and, this, this wacky. You know, it's one guy who's, you know, I, you know, I'm sure you have the same, but I have a lot of friends who are like super famous now. And, and you know, they, they don't have regular lives, you know, they can't, like John Stewart or Dennis Leary, and then, you know, they just, they continue to be good guys, because they, I think the, the key is to keep good people around you to keep you in line. And I think yeah, those, yeah, Ray, right. Ray Romano is like that, he's, uh, he kind of stays yeah. the same all the time, you know, they never really change, which I like about that. There's a few guys out there that uh, I've had some some dealings with, in fact, I, I told a few of them off, I told one guy just to go to hell, because, uh, you know, I, I says, listen, man, just because you're driving a Mercedes and just because you're uh, you're famous and you're open for 50,000 people, I personally don't give a shit. All I care about is if you come by, you say, hi, Frank. I mean, Robin Williams will say, hi, Frank. Uh, Eddie Murphy will, you know, tap me on the chest and say, hey, Pace, how you doing? You know, Rich uh, Chris Rock will say, hey, Frankie, how are you? That's all I ask. And, you know, this guy just walked by like, you know, he's a big star. And I says, hey, man. 
you want to be a big star, well, you know, you know go screw yourself. I don't, I don't need Lonely. you. Lonely. And, you know, and it's, 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 that mostly comes out of insecurity because, you know, people, they just, you know, they get famous and they, they, they're really riding the, the famous part. Yeah. As opposed to what got them there. Because, you know, it's easy to become famous. You know, Paris Hilton's famous and yeah. Kardashians are famous. You know, they don't do anything. But you, so you can be famous. That's not, not the, you know, there are some TV shows that comics go on and they get very famous from, and they're not amazing comedians, but, you know, they do very well. But that doesn't make them a better person or a cooler person. Yeah, yeah. It just means more people know who they are by happenstance, you know. It, it's it's Always, stri- I mean, you know, George Carlin was famous because he was brilliant and everyone loved him, and, and but he still, to this day, was always, you know, till the day he died, he was always good to young comics and... I, I ran into hundreds, literally hundreds of comics who said, yeah, I, I saw George Carlin, I talked to him, and he, then he spent 15, 20 minutes with me. Yeah, yeah, I ran into him in uh, uh, the Trump Marina. I don't know if it's called that anymore. Uh, Dennis Blair was o- always opening for uh, for uh, Colin, and I was working in uh, one of the other rooms, and I says, i got to go see Dennis, say hello, you know. I, I didn't go to see George, I wanted to go see Dennis. So the guys let me backstage, and I'm walking around, and I see this guy, I thought he was a stagehand. He was all in black. I says, hey, pal, I see Dennis Blair. He goes, yeah, he, yeah, he'll be out in a little while. And I said, turn around, I go, holy crap, <laughs> it's George Collin. It's George, man. He goes, oh, yeah, how are you? And I says, what are you doing here? I says, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a friend of Dennis Blair's. You're a comic. He's, he says, yeah, yeah. He says, you look familiar. Do I know you from somewhere? I says, probably, the, probably a Catch a Rising Star or something, you know. I was so lucky, you know, that I got to be close to him. I got to actually book him on TV, which was so cool. Yeah, that's got to be great, yeah. And then I got to be close to him, and then he would go over my material, and he would he became like, like a coach to me in a lot of ways. You know, we talk about how you do certain material. Like, you know, I said to him, I said, George, you know, I like to talk about religion. I've always wanted to talk about it, you know, and he says, as long as it's your perception, you can't, no one can argue with you. Yeah. As long as you're telling him your perception. He says, you can make fun of other people, but it's not effective. He said, if you give it your perception, they can't argue with you. And he also told me something that was cool. He said, "What well, you know, look at it from their perspective and try to get yourself inside their head. And a lot of the comedy is written by them. Yeah. Ah. Hmm, that makes a lot of so sense. That, that really worked out. So you put it back in their, in their lap the way they see it. And when they laugh, they realize they're laughing at themselves. I mean, he was, of course, a genius. And he was of course, so... Yeah into detail and minutia and all this other stuff and i was very 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 lucky and blessed to have him as a you know once it was my hero and then became my friend richie minavini you know richie right very well richie minavini uh once went up to george and said george how do you get a, a, a special every year. How do you do it? How do you get a special every year? He said, oh, I, God, I would love to write for you. He said, you want to write for me? Because yeah, he goes, he goes uh, get, I, 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 what do you say? Give me two days. Two days, I, I want 15 good jokes within two days. And uh, Richie was calling up all his friends. I'm, I'm going to write for George Collins. I'm going to write for George Collins. And he was racking his brains out to get 15 really strong jokes. And he says I was up all night typing and rewriting and... <laughs> Finally, he brings the paper to George, and George says, well, I can only use five of these. But you see what you got here? And he goes, yeah. I goes, I do this every day, 365 days a year. That's how I get a special on HBO every year. Wow, that's amazing. And, that's, uh, I, and you know, just in the fact of, of learning that, that, that information is so, you know, so valuable. And, and Richie learned a lot from that, you know. Yeah, Richie's still going strong. You know, a friend of mine said, you know, I went to the Borgata the other day, and I saw this guy, Richie Minervini, and he was so funny, and my parents were laughing, and I'm going, good old Richie, still going at it, you know, <laughs> still making him laugh. You started out as a warm-up comic, though, didn't you? You started working with Dana Carvey, and uh, you did save, you did warm-up for Save Saved by, by the Bell? Saved by the Bell. I went to college at Emerson, like I said, and there was a guy who was production guy on Saved by the Bell. I was out in L.A., broke, broke, broke working every night at the comedy store just try hustling to get spots so I can, you know, pay right. whatever bill I can right. pay. And uh, this friend of mine uh, contacted me and said, look, you know, we're doing this TV show and we need a warm-up comic. Will you do it? And I never did warm-up or anything. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, now, now, warm-up comic, is that the same kind of material you use or you have to use it, have a different uh, uh, feel 
to the audience. I mean, in other words, no, you're game... like the, you're a liaison. It's a different kind of a job. Yeah, you know, yeah. you do stand up in a sense, but really, it's you having a conversation with people and keeping them awake and and interested focused yeah, because yeah. you know it's a long taping, and especially Saved by the Bell with kids. You know, so the audience was a bunch of kids who had very short attention span. It's like babysitting. You know, that job yeah. was like babysitting, and it was uh, the best part of the job though was it was literally five feet from The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. It was across the hall from that, so I mm -hmm. got to interact with a lot of people there and stand on that stage. It was amazing. So how did you work your way to a, to a Letterman eventually? Did you did you know David ahead of time? Well, oh, I had met him through Mitchell Walters. Ah, um, uh, Mitchell. <laughs> and when I first had got to the comedy store in LA, Mitzi Shore was very good to me, and she <coughs> good to my son, which is so cool. Uh, all these years later, he's a comic. That's mm -hmm. a whole story. But Mitzi was very good to me at the beginning, and she would put me on uh, every night, and she would put me on early. And I go, why do you put me on so early? She goes, because you remind me of David Letterman, and I want to, I put him on early because he could get the crowd going. You know, that's actually right, not right. a great of impression. But <laughs> he was, he was so, she just thought that I would be this kind of a guy. So anyway, years later, Louis C.K. is working for the show. Bill Sheff is working for the show. And they need a new warm-up, and they recommend me. And I meet Dave, and he seemed cool, and he seemed cool with me. And they gave me a six-week trial period and back in 97. And I've been there ever since. Uh, February 16th, it'll be 16 years. Wow. That's pretty good, man. Not bad. And then I started booking the show in 2001. Right. It was really cool. I did that for 11 years. And... And uh, I'm not booking it anymore, but I'm booking the Great American Comedy Festival. Yeah, what what is that now? That's Johnny uh, Carson. What is that? Is that out out west somewhere or? No, it's in Nebraska, in Johnny Carson's hometown of Norfolk, Nebraska, in the middle of the middle of middle of nowhere, is this town that Johnny lived, and Johnny loved it there. And in fact, he did a special on it that I remembered so well that I saw when I was you know watching the Tonight Show. Anyway, these people are fantastic, and they love Johnny, and Johnny loved them, and Johnny did everything for them, and he built a theater in this town, a 1,200-plus seat theater that is just state-of-the-art. So you in this cornfield, you open the high school doors, and there's this theater that Johnny built. <laughs> now every year, this is our sixth year, um, 2013, that we're doing this comedy festival, and it's become a huge, major comedy festival that, you know, we pay people well, we, we treat them really like gold, and we fly them in, we put them up. You know, it's, it's a pretty good festival, and it, has, it takes care of kids, it takes care of amateurs, it takes care of, uh, you know, the pros, and uh, we bring in some stars and legends, like we've had Dick Cavett and Ed Asner and Cloris Leachman, and, you know, it's pretty good then, because Johnny loved magic, we brought in magicians, some of the best magicians in the world, you know, it's 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 turned out to be a pretty darn good thing. So I'm just about next week going to go out and start looking on the West Coast for some comics for the festival. And then in March I'll go again and look for some more, you know, because I'm keeping yeah. my, my hands inside the booking business. What do you think of the new comics today? I mean, the material is, uh, I mean, it's really getting raw. I'm, 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 I, I watched a comic uh, recently and I'm just staring at him going, what is that? Why? Why are they laughing? But uh, maybe I'm just getting old, and I'm, my time has come. And uh, you know, well, you are getting old, but you, you know, <laughs> we all get old every day, and then, you know, we're old. You know, people say that Eddie, you're old school. I go, well, there's nothing wrong with being old. No, there is. There is. You know what it is? Funny is funny, man. I don't. I don't care if you're ninety. Look, George Burns was making people laugh at a hundred. Come on. Yeah. You know, Milton Burrow, Phyllis Diller, yeah. making people laugh in their 90s. Joan Rivers, I was just watching her on TV. She does a show about people, you know, dressing up. The woman's hysterical. She's hysterical. I was, I couldn't stop laughing, man. She was coming out with stuff. One of my heroes, and I got to meet her. And one of, one of the many cool things that have happened in my life, I've been very happy such a cool life because I'm doing what I love. I went up to her to go, hi, my name is, and before I finish, she goes, I know who you are. You're Eddie Brill. And I was like, oh, my God, Phyllis Diller. <laughs> it, was. it was so great and she hugged me and she was great and she always made me laugh so hard and she was just so great so anyway you know so you're talking about the kids there are a lot of great young kid comics there's you know tommy jonigan is a young comic who is just i you know i met him when he was like 24 or so and he's just brilliant you know he's a smart funny silly great comic and there's uh you know, there's about you know, there's about fifteen or twenty young comics that bring every year. There's yeah. a guy I saw 
not long ago, and his name is Jared Carmichael, and he was so funny and smart, and so they're still great comics. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, the percentage, it's a combination of, the, the percentage of the comics, there's a small percentage that are really good, and they will be good, and they'll always be funny, and then there's a big percentage that are not. And, uh, but because of the internet and because of the access we have all over the world, we're seeing all of the comics. Yeah, exactly. We think there's more exactly. shit, but it's always been a, group, a yeah. big amount of shit. Yeah, small amount of great. You know, it's it's that karaoke uh, mentality. Oh, oh I, I could do that. But you know what? I have to say this. No matter what, I respect everyone who does it. It's the hard, you know how hard it is to. Yeah. Work. You know how much work we we have to put in. Oh, I don't down. I don't down anybody. I just look and wonder, and I'm going. Where is where is the the staple of comedy going? I mean, I watched this guy; he was like really raw. I mean, he was talking about you know shit coming out of his ass, and I'm going like, hey, you what? know that's you know. I'm going, what the only hell? Only a few guys who were able to pull that off, like Robert Schimmel, who is amazing. Who was one of my dearest friends, and it's like my brother. And he took me all over the the country, traveling yeah. with him, opening for him. Uh, he had it in his contract that I had to open for him, though, which was fantastic. And one of the things that he did, we got to Cleveland and Hilarities, and the owner, who eventually I became great friends with, but he's like, I don't know this Eddie Brill. And Schimmel says, well, if you don't like him, you could take the 700 bucks out of my pay. Right. Because right. you're on. And then I ended up working, and it went fine, and I worked for that club for still to this day, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how Schimmel was. And Schimmel was, you know, had X-rated material, but... It was smart. It was funny. Yeah, it that's was, you know, fine. Yeah, I understand guys that. Guys out there who are dirty, who are yeah. funny, but there's some guys out there who are just thinking they're going to get a laugh by saying the word shit or fuck. Yeah, it's a gratuitous. You know, it's well, you know something. You're 20 years old. What the hell do you know? You know, you, you're with your peers. They'll laugh at. They'll laugh at that because it's silly, and they, they would love to say it, and they're glad you're saying it because they could hear it and laugh and have a good time and not worry about that they said it. You know. And uh, as you as you get older, you start get wiser, and you know you got a family, and you say, "Hey, wait a minute, I got kids. I don't want to hear that crap," you know. Right. And so that's what actually happens. Once this kid goes up the ranks in age, I guess his material will force him. You know, he'll be forced to or not, change. or maybe, maybe he'll not. Just maybe. fall to the wayside and yeah. and just be this guy who cursed a lot, and that's how what got yeah. left. I remember when I was first doing stand up. If I was ad libbing and it wasn't working, I'd curse like crazy because that's how was my crutch. Yeah, to get the laughs. Yeah. Like, hey, that's fucking crazy, right? Yeah, ha ha ha. ha. Something like that, and and yeah. we're like, yeah. Well, I confess, I was dirty too in the beginning. I mean, uh, you saw, you know, monkey see, monkey do, man. Everybody's doing it. I'm doing it too. And but then I realized, hey, I got to make a living at this. And uh, you know, at that time, uh, the big money was the clean money. You know, you worked in the comedy clubs at that time. There wasn't any cable or anything to, to move you forward. So uh, you worked the comedy clubs in those days. That's it. You worked the comedy clubs. But if you wanted to make the clean money, you know, you had to be clean. The, I mean, the big money, you had to be clean to, to work the corporates and the, the big private parties and all the big shows that, you know, are in the casinos. And now it's like really, it's starting to go down I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. But money's, the money's not out there. You know, the, the crowds are not, uh, the, you know, people don't have that money anymore to just, you know, that uh, disposable that's, income. But I think it's it, it, a lot of money. That's sad in one way, but it also is a cleanser in another because I think that's going to weed out all the bad all the bad ones and the good ones. I hope the good ones will. Well, they will. They'll come right through. Uh, they'll again, the cream yeah. again, just yeah. like we were talking earlier about cream rises to the top. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. going to happen with the, the clubs as well. But even some of the good clubs used to do like three on a Saturday. They're only doing two on a Saturday. So, you you know, you make a little bit less money that way. Yeah. But you know what, Frankie? I woke up today and I did stand up tonight and uh, I was on stage at the Ed Sullivan Theater and, uh, you know, you know, it's the coolest, I had the coolest day that anyone can ever have, you know. So I count my blessings every day that I get up and I get to do what I love, you know. Yeah, that's it's great, man. And you do a lot of benefits, too, right? You do charities. You want to name a few of them? I know one of them is the American Cancer Society. Yeah, you know, I worked with the Cancer Society for a long time. My stepfather, who was very we were very, very close, he, uh, he died of cancer at 37 yeah. years old and, it, you know, just broke us apart and actually, you know, just, destroyed us as a family because yeah. we were so young and it was every, it was five kids and whatever. And uh, so I always vowed to help the cancer society, but now I learned a lot about cancer and, and, and nutrition and health, and I 
you know, started realizing that we can prevent cancer, you know, yeah. not with pharmaceuticals and chemotherapy and all this crap, but just to clean up our nutrition system, the food we put in our body, and in many cases can reverse the cancer. So, you know, all these years I've been working with the Cancer Society, all I've been doing is helping doctors, you know, uh, raise more money to buy bigger equipment that's not really doing yeah. any good. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So it's, now I'm able to, I'm really, my goal now these days is trying to promote, you know, to get rid of disease by, by cleaning up nutrition and laughing and having a good attitude. Well, you're, I understand from what I heard from a few friends lately, because, you know, I keep tabs on you. <laughs> uh, I found out that you're getting into this real health kick lately, and are you trimming down? Yeah, I, I lost like 135 pounds. Good for you, man, that's terrific. Are you, are you on a treadmill, too? Are you working out? Yeah, well, you work, got to work out a little bit because when you lose yeah. all that weight, you got to make sure it comes off, the, that you're not just a bunch of flab and whatever. So I do that too, and I, you know, but mostly I learned about food and nutrition. And, you know, we've been lied to all this time. You know, we're yeah. lied to, you know, milk doesn't do a body good. In fact, it, it, it's just one of the most horrible things we can put in our body is pasteurized dairy. And it really is just awful, and it, it yeah. causes, you know, we lose calcium and zinc from our bones. And it's a bad, it's a bad for a lot of stuff. You get sinus problems with that. You get, yeah, you, know, you get sick. It's just, yeah. you know, it just it doesn't work in the human body, and it only it prevents absorption. It's all these lies, and you know what? We've been lied to, and we found out. I found out we've been lied to, and the reason we were lied to is because there's so much money involved. Oh, sure. That's what I'm out there trying to push more. Yeah. You know, you asked me about charities and stuff. I'm just trying to help. Everyone I know, I want everyone I know to feel as good as I feel. And, uh, you know, I mean, look, you know, I'm 54 and you get older and then you start needing Cialis and Viagra and all this kind of stuff. And then once I cleaned my body out and I got rid of all the toxins and all the crap and all the poisons and put good food in, my vascular system is fine and I don't need any of those pills anymore. I'm yeah. rocking and rolling. Yeah, yeah, that's it, man. You know? I, I uh, believe it or not, I have a teaspoon of cinnamon and two teaspoons of honey in hot water every morning and that's supposed to Way be to one start the day yeah it's the best the best thing for you and, and it's uh it helps you lose weight believe it or not uh it does a lot of it, people should really read up on it cinnamon yeah and uh honey. We do. we've got to clean ourselves and get yeah. rid of we're all addicted we're addicted to food we're addicted to food that's full of fake sugar and salt and uh, fats that are bad for us and and the, and the people in charge of that know that, and they make billions and billions of dollars based on our addictions. I worked in a, I, I worked in Aruba when I was working in Aruba. I did a corporate show for this big uh, conglomerate uh, pharmaceutical uh, conglomeration, and uh, while I was up there having my salmon, you know, and uh, my my bagel and my cream cheese, and I hear these guys laughing and bragging about the money that they're making, you know, uh, on these pills where it cost them maybe a, a penny to make a hundred pills. They charge, you know, like you know, a buck. And they're all bragging about how much money they're making. They're so happy. And I'm, I'm going, hey, man. Ed, you know, it's greed over compassion, and that's yeah. the biggest problem in our yeah. society. It's just a lot, there's a lot of greed. And, you know, that's what happens. Money, you know, people are just very greedy, and they make money, and they want to, and that's another addiction. Yeah. They make more and more, and they're all, you know, those kind of people. It's kind of sad that our world is made up of people who don't want people to get better. In fact, the people who are spending hundreds of dollars on these pills they're just getting addicted to these pills, and they're not actually helping themselves. You yeah. know what pharmaceuticals are for? As a stopgap measure when you're sick and you're about to die. And then the best thing to do is to wean yourself off the pharmaceuticals right. as soon right. as possible, and then go back to eating real food right. and eating nutrition. And that makes sense, but we're all addicted to these pills, and they want us to be addicted. No one in this country should have diabetes type 2. No one. And no pill is going to help you with it. It's just going to help you with the symptoms you get from diabetes. But you know what these guys do, though? They go, you know, oh, I'm taking the pills now, so now I could eat more. <laughs> they take, the, you know, they take these diabetic pills. I'm taking pills. the pills so I can kill myself. Yeah, they, the guy's up like, you know, he's shooting 300, and he's going, hey, man, I take these pills, it shoots me down to 250, and I could eat more. Oh, wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to try to lose weight, you know. I know, but you know what? Again, we're all addicted, so you can't blame yeah. people and how addicted we are. But back to the original question was, I, I love working with kids, and I yeah. I, have, I used to work with the Roberto Clemente Foundation to help kids down in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Roberto Clemente was my hero. And then I also work with the school system in New York. We're doing improv comedy in the schools, in the un underprivileged kids, 
in the schools and, you know, instead of them having, like, gang stuff after school, they're coming and sticking around and doing comedy and they're loving it and a lot of kids are coming to these things and it's really made a difference in a lot of kids' lives. So I've been doing as many, th- and also juvenile diabetes. So, yeah. you know, the other thing I'm working with, I've been working with for a few years now, I came up with the idea, I have a friend who has uh, had breast cancer and she had a double mastectomy and she was really feeling low that she wasn't a woman anymore and i said are you kidding me i said you know you you know that doesn't change who you are on the because of who you are on the outside and i thought you know i i had just seen this movie with helen mirren where it's a bunch of old ladies and they got naked for a calendar or whatever you yeah know, and I yeah thought, yeah so here's what i thought of and it's been going on for years now it's a calendar. It's not a naked calendar. It's a calendar of women who each month has a great story about how they had breast cancer and they survived, and now they have these great lives. And they're, you know, they, so it gives other women, you know, the sort of strength to go, look, I can go through this cancer and then, you know, still have a great life, have children, have get married, you know, do all these wonderful things. They're, like one month, there's a, a woman she's pitching for the Stanford baseball team, and then another woman who runs the marathon and. And now, you know, a lot of men get breast cancer. Not yeah. a lot, but a, yeah. a percentage of them do. So now we have men on the calendar. So it's pretty cool. I've been doing I, I really, you know, because I'm loving my life so much, it's really nice to be able to charity stuff. Cancer is, it's like, um, it's, I don't know, it's an evil thing. It's I cancer, mean, for God's sake. I mean, you, 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 when you get rid of it in one spot, it seems to want to come up somewhere else. It's, it's diabolical, you know. It's We all have uh, cancer in our body. We all have cancer cells. Yeah. We'll do. It's just a matter of setting them off. You could set it off with a bad attitude. Really? You can eat all the healthy food in the world. You have a bad attitude. You can get cancer. You can get all yeah. the diseases. It's the T-cells, it's right? It's mind, body, spirit. But you're going to, it just is a, it's a matter of science. If you have an alkaline system, cancer can survive in it. It's going to mostly go away. It's just, it's that simple. Uh, we already have the cure for cancer. We have the, cure, the prevention of, cure for the prevention of cancer. It exists. It's just people have to understand what it is, and, uh, you know, but once people find out, a lot of very wealthy people are going to be up unhappy because they, they're greedy and they want to... Oh, isn't that too bad? Isn't that too bad? At all. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, uh, uh, well, as Sal Richard always said, laughter is the best medicine, and uh, you keep them laughing out there, and uh, you're, you're doing great payback, and you're getting you're getting your uh, your career, you're enjoying your life, and that's all that counts, and I want to thank you for coming on the show and spending some time with me and talking about this stuff. It's always a pleasure, Frankie. The great thing about this is that I forgot that we were doing an interview. <laughs> you and I were just sitting around having a conversation on the phone. Well, that's what I, that's what I like to do. I don't I don't like to be so proper with all this. You know, it's got to be loose, and I like it. You know, the way it should be. You've always been a great guy. You've been great to me throughout my whole career as a friend, as a as a fellow comic, and I really appreciate you know that you're doing this and and getting the word out of all the comics and stuff like that. And and I'll you know I'll always be that guy to try to help the young comics like you are. And you know so. I, I respect you, I love you, and I'm glad we got to do the interview. Great. You stay well, and don't lose too much money tonight, all right? All right, yeah. All right. 12 bucks, I'll blame it on you. All right, take care, Eddie. Be well, Frankie. Love that you. was a comedian, a talent coordinator, uh, warm-up comic, Eddie Brill. Oh, by the way, you can go to eddiebrill.com and check out Eddie uh, if you want to know more.